four of us here today to the topic for the day of homosexuality in the church. Is it, is it right? Is it scriptural? And who can go with this? And who does not have to go uh, Our first question is going to be, do you understand God's law? Do you understand God's law? So if anybody has any uh, input on what God's law is and how it affects our lifestyles and our fear of Jesus, go ahead and begin to answer and interject on that question there. The first question is, do you understand God's law? I seem to be a person that looks at a lot of words and to read the question, do you understand God's law? Understand and knowing is two different things. Uh, God's law can be explained throughout the word, but we don't really understand uh, law because we don't come from kingdoms. Uh, when you, when you uh, understand how a king decrees, he don't have to have it voted on. So looking at God's law, if God said it, it is law. Uh, concerning this particular subject, it's different because some things are set and other things are declared. But God's law is set no matter what it is. If he said it, it's his law. Um, my input. My input on God's law. Uh, it's, it's the law in which all other laws are based on, not just the Ten Commandments, not just the 640 ordinances that was handwritten by Moses, which was abolished when Christ died on the cross, but the Ten Commandments are still in full effect. But there are other universal laws in effect as well that most of the public isn't even aware of. Even the church is not even aware of these universal laws that are in effect. But the law that support all, every law in the universe is the law of life. And that law of life is love. And my scriptural reference to this law of love is based on what I'm reading out of the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. It says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now according to the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is thou shalt love the Lord with all thy mind, all thy heart, all thy strength, all thy might. And it's based in one word, and that's love. Anybody else have a response to it? Yeah, I, oh. I'd like to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I have to agree with the first uh, speaker. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, it's the law. It's the total law. And the scripture talks about, thy word, O Lord, is forever settled. Therefore, uh, we, we have to also be aware that the scripture talks about study to show yourself approved. Uh, there are instances in the law, the total word of God, that the Bible tells us that are some things hard to be understood. So there are some things that we can grasp pretty easily, and there are other things that require the real intervention of the Spirit of God. But it's all the law, all 66 books. Now how they are applied and what they relate to are different things. 
God has given us a law, and He's also given us the, His Spirit. But in answer to the first question, uh, do you understand? I guess that's a personal re preference. And yes, I understand. So in, in answering that in the positive. Yes, I want like you to interject in that um, concerning the law. As the gentleman said, God's law is, set, is settled and established forever. And um, before, you know, we have different dispensations. And before the dispensation of the law, there was dispensation of innocence. But when the law came into effect, it was to make us aware of the things, make us aware of sin. And also, as they were said, to understand, okay, we have the law of physics, we have the law of gravity, we have all these different laws. Just because you do not understand it, do not make it of none effect. Like a little baby walking, it don't understand the law of gravity, but it walk, it fall, it don't understand why I'm fall. That baby don't understand why I fall, but we do because of the law of gravity. So I'm saying in effect, even if we do not, understand God's law, it does not make it none effect. So because uh, what God has established is said because uh, even if you go to court, the judge, first thing the judge says, ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you broke that law, you don't know you should have run a red light, you burn a red light, but we see you're going to get a ticket anyway, whether you understand it or not. So understanding God's law it's better to it's better to not know than not do. But we need to study to get to know and to understand God's law because it is said, "With all I get, get and understand." Okay, my understanding is I would have to agree with the first minister. <coughs> And that is, I think we understand God's law to the degree. And the reason I say that is because God's law reflects his character, who he is. And he's an inexhaustible. You know? So we can never fully understand who he is. So from my perspective, scripturally, what I'm understanding biblically, you need an eternity to spend with a God that you can never get to know everything about him. So it's impossible for us to know this total law. I just want to uh, <coughs> throw this in there with the other thing you said about uh, the commandments. Also in Mark verse 30, and that's this not funny that this is at the top. Because Mark verse 30 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is likely unto this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So if we can't get the love thing right, no matter how we deal with issues, if it's not done with love and understanding of love, we're missing the whole point. Because everything lies and falls on love. It's like, it's like to interject uh, real quickly here. It's, it's like when an engineer designs a piece of equipment or machinery. Uh, if the machinery or equipment is not operating, according to the way it was designed. Eventually, it's going to break down and malfunction. And so these laws are put into place to teach us how to live, how to live according to the way God created us to live. Uh, we are very much a part of him, very much a part of him, not just spiritually, but mentally as well. Uh, I like what Paul says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, you know. Uh, our minds is part of his mind. Just like if I take a drop of salt water out of the ocean, that salt water 
is still part of the ocean. It has, it has the same properties, which is sodium chloride, as the ocean. The only difference is in volume. The same it is with our mind pertaining to the Lord. We have the same attributes we were created in His image and likeness. So it, is, it behooves us to follow His laws because the laws are there to teach us how to live. I, I, like to, I, I think we're missing more. At least I'm, what I'm hearing is different from what the question suggests. The question doesn't ask about laws, period. Laws, as if there are many, it just says, "Do you understand God's law?" Which seems to suggest, "Do you understand the word?" Since the word is His law, maybe I'm missing. Thank you. If, if I could build on what that man was just saying over there, the minister, it's like it's like the land that we build in. If we didn't have any law, we wouldn't have any order. Well, we would have order, it would be chaotic order. So to understand God's law, I believe is really saying understanding God's way, the way he is, the way his standards, his statutes, his, his way of doing things. It's, it's do we understand who and how God operates? Period. Because if we didn't have, if God didn't have law and order in the heavens, that was one of the reasons Lucifer was kicked out. Because he went against the law and order that God had established in the heavens. So he had to be dispelled out of heaven. Because so we need to understand God's law. And once we understand it, it's good for us to obey God's law. Well, I appreciate you for putting us back on track. Um, the one thing that I, I want to say here is we're saying we're what we think about the law is, but collectively, if you want to broaden that a little bit and say as the United States or as the world, clearly we don't understand God's law. Clearly. Okay? So from that standpoint, we don't. We do not. We don't have a clue. Even with this word that he has given us, we're so far from that. Now it's just strictly relative. You know, you do what you want to do. Uh, do as you see fit, or do as you see fit as you being God. So you create your own law. I think we can move on to that because you have a pretty good understanding. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do want to. Um, for uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Mr. Clarity. I did want to ask for some clarity. Um, all I'm saying is I didn't want to ask for some clarity uh, about the question. So the question is, could you repeat it again? The question is, do you understand God's law? Okay, so the way the question is written, I, it kind of begs a yes or no. Um, but I don't know if you're looking to, for us to expound beyond that like it's already been done. Um, but then I still have another question. What, what, uh, what law are you talking about? Because I think making that distinction, we're talking about uh, you know, old covenant law, we're talking about new covenant law, because depending on which covenant and which uh, uh, testament you place yourself in determines what law uh, you're actually talking about. Actually, that question is for overall view of his law. Overall. Overall. And is do you, do you want an explanation to our understanding? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, under the old covenant law, uh, prior to uh, Christ, but then also inclusive of Christ's time on this earth, uh, which he demonstrated and fulfilled the law, uh, while he walked the earth, uh, he, in essence, by fulfilling the law, uh, old covenant law, abolished it. Uh, 
and so far that he fulfilled it, and so then instituted a new law under the new covenant, and it would behoove us to clarify or outline what those distinctions are. Uh, so understanding God's law, I think, requires that you have to understand uh, Old Testament, Intertestament, and then New Testament uh, in order to have a clear understanding of what you should be standing on today. Well, as minister, you know, just folk know from for me, when I understand God's law and that He is immutable, not changing, He may have given stages of it, but His law is the same from my perspective. And I, I only retort with that God is immutable and unchanging, uh, but His law clearly has changed. Um, and it's not that His law is unchanging, it's more to the point that He, God, is unchanging. He may uh, change how we interact towards Him uh, for different reasons because one of the most important distinctions between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that no one person um, had the Holy Spirit residing in them uh, like we do in the New Covenant. There were times where the Holy Spirit would overshadow people and would inhabit people for a moment uh, to do whatever God's will was at that time period, but that they would not continually have the Holy Spirit residing in them. And so by necessity of the Holy Spirit now uh, being possible to reside, for to reside in man, um, constitutes a change in how we interact with each other and with God um, because some things were more necessary without the Spirit of God residing in us uh, than they were uh, with God's Spirit in us. Uh, one of the bigger examples, and I'm just bringing it up, I'm not going to get into the details unless you um, <laughs> but uh, fasting, for instance, um, was put in place to help people to monitor their behavior so that they would be available uh, to each other in the community uh, so that God's arms were your arms. You know, when you set aside time to fast and you had all this food in your refrigerator, I know they have refrigerators, so you had all this food, you would, who, where would that food go before it went bad while you're fasting? What would make you conscious of your neighbors who were in need and have you pass that food along? And so when you have that spirit inside of you, residing, it's the difference now of making it where you respond to the Spirit telling you to do those things on a personal level um, in your individual scenario. So I just think that distinction requires that we behave differently uh, as it relates to the law and to this unchanging God that we that we serve and worship. I think that the sum of who do you understand God's law? I think that is a good example of understanding God's law. I just wanted to, I actually wrote that question because I wanted to know different people's perspective, where they are as far as God, as an overall view. So it seems like everybody is pretty solid though, so we're going to move on. Well, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, sir. Well, I just wanted to say, I think this issue of the law is it's too vast. It's too vast the issue. Uh, sometimes we operate on a misnomer that the law is, is over. It's not. Uh, we need to really understand in terms of what aspects of the law were present, were the ordinances, were the judgments. If we're not making clear distinctions, even Paul says, I, I still fulfill the law in my members. That's New Testament. So what are we, the subject is so broad. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. So I just think maybe another period where we can devote just to the law would really help. Can I speak to that last uh, scripture? Uh, just to validate uh, the point. Um, in Matthew 5, uh, 17, it says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
However, also, uh, that was what I would consider intertestament uh, understanding. Uh, but also, if you turn to Ephesians uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For he himself, uh, speaking of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to which God ruled the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so I would agree with what the uh, minister just said in the sense that uh, we should be more uh, specific as to uh, how the law has changed and how it's to be uh, understood or perceived, um, and we need to spend more time on that. Uh, maybe requires another subject day or, or whatever, or maybe it's integral to the point of the overall lesson. I, I, I would leave that for the, the host. Those, those handwritten ordinances that I was referring to that Moses written down by hand that was directed by God. Those handwritten ordinances. They were placed on the side of the Ark of the Covenant as a testament against the nation of Israel. The Ten Commandments, which were written by the finger of God, which is eternal, were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. This scripture that you just read out of chapter 2 of Ephesians is referring to those ordinances that were handwritten by Moses. I would only ask if there are specific reference in this passage that clarifies that or something. I don't have so a reference on me, but I can't get it for you. I do have it, I just don't have it with me. Okay. Well, I just think that God wants us to follow his way. Um, understanding the God's law, I think he just wants us to accomplish his will to the end. I just like to make this quick point. Uh, agree with you he said about not abolishing or to destroy. It's like our constitution, right? We have a constitution, but as age is progressing, as you know, things change, society change, there are amendments to the constitution. We have amendments, and then we do add some things too. So in God's law, okay, he didn't destroy it, okay, that is still in place, but he has amended it through, uh, through the dispensations that we come into. And I don't deny the um, uh, previous minister's uh, claim uh, or uphold uh, without the reference uh, that would be required to make that link that the law is being discussed in Ephesians 2, 14 uh, through 16. Um, as being something that was set on the side of the ark as opposed to being put inside of the ark. Not to say that that's not said, more so that this scripture is referencing one or the other in how uh, it's relayed, but that I still want to uphold scripture in this sense until the other reference uh, is found. Um, but that it says, just to, just for clarity's sake, um, says, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, which was the law, by abolishing the flesh, um, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And so, again, I, I do want to uphold that and I do want to agree with the uh, sister minister as well, uh, who said that God wants us to do his will and I think the only way that we can began doing his will is strictly by understanding and knowing what law uh, we're to be following. I didn't, I'm, I've never claimed or said that there is no law whatsoever. I merely said that the old covenant law has been abolished and then there's a new covenant law. And if you understand what the new covenant law is, it does not incorporate 
the old covenant because we know that there's a parable that Jesus uses that says you can't take new wine and put it in old wine schemes. And so there has to be a clear distinction. Uh, Jesus demonstrated during an intertestament time period on the law because he was fulfilling it. But once he died, uh, he ushered in the new covenant. So we know that the books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, are not distinctions of the new covenant itself. They're only distinctions of the New Testament time period. But the new covenant did not begin until Christ died. You know the words testament is like a will and testament. And so your will does not go into effect until you die. And so the New Testament's principles and the new law that we're under did not begin until Christ died. And then through the Holy Spirit is where the execution is dependent on uh, to be relied on. And the New Testament in Hebrews expressly clarified what the new law is. So I would only ask that we, at, at some point in clarity, look towards what the new law is in Scripture versus what the Old Testament or Old Covenant law is. And by comparing those two, will you be able to decipher what uh, uh, carried over, if you believe that, or, or what what didn't carry over, if you don't believe that? I'll get that information. Yeah. Okay. Great. Clearly, we don't have a whole panel discussion on the law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Stealing is a behavior, 
the, the significance to me in terms of homosexuality and what makes it stand out is that it is the one of the behaviors that one, the scripture says, sins against his own body. The other is that God, when he classifies something as an abomination, it means that the degree of hatred from the standpoint of God is intense. But there's still behaviors. And no, I don't think the person is born homosexual. I also don't think that um, a person can be born that way. But the scripture tells us that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And iniquity is different than sin. It is a bending away towards something. You have a tendency when you were born to be geared toward something certain that was in your bloodline. Uh, you can't really just, as a baby, tell whether or not they will be gay or straight or whatever you want to call it. Uh, because what happens is, during the period of time you're in this life, a lot of factors come into play. And depending on the way you control your own self and your teaching, and the word that is put into you really sets the tone for where you would go. But that really doesn't hold you from being that way. We want to put the sin on the particular feeling of homosexuality, but that's not the issue. The issue is the practice of it. That's when, that's when the Bible tells you about it. It names all the lying and all the stuff like that and puts it into one. But it says homosexual practice. Now, we want to beat them up because of the way they feel. But I've never been, I've been around a lot. And uh, I have never seen anything that's particularly come out of the womb that way. It is not, it's, it's not. But as far as the iniquity, we were shaping that. And depending on what was in your bloodline through the years and your grandmother and your grandmother's grandmother's, and it will show up if it is not dealt with. Whether it's drunkenness, whether it's uh, homosexuality, whether it's messing with kids or whatever, that was in your bloodline. You have to deal with that particular issue. Glad to be following these last two ministers, and knowing that I came up underneath these guys, so I feel the same way. My answer to that is no, as well. Um, I don't think that we're going to we all going in sin, and whichever particular sin that that take, grabs a hold of us and enslaves us, we play it out. Also. Um, we are not left in the state where we are as bad as we could be. All of us here on this panel. If it wasn't for God's grace, we would be much worse than we are because we all have the capacity to be like Hitler. You know, we have that same sin nature that Hitler had. Same sin nature that Pharaoh had. And if you, you remember, God said that he's going to uh, harden Pharaoh's heart. We know it. That God doesn't push us to sin or force us to sin. But what he does is he brings his grace that much further back to allow you to be as bad as you could be. So all of us here could fall to that same sin we're talking about, homosexuality, if it wasn't for God's grace. And I think that's where we have to come from and understand that the sin issue is the problem. And how we acted out in his life is what takes hold of us. But as the gospel gets a hold to us, we are being sanctified and you deal with that sin that you have in your life and you, you loathe it, you hate it. But my answer to the question is no. I want to say no 
So that, you know, I don't believe the person could be born in human sexual uh, section. His God of the Genesis 1, 27, he said, God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. My answer to the second question is no, too. But I just like to read scripture to go with that. Uh, reading from Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 32. It says, says Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in, in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of error which was meet to them. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbites, fears of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Uh, like the, like the lady minister said, God created male and female. That's the bottom line right there. So when God makes a, made a distinction in his creation, he didn't make a mistake. Because then God can't make mistakes. So you can't sit, well, you should not sit and say, I was born in this way. God, when you are created in the womb, God knew you from the womb, even before you were created. If he created you a male, you are a male. Here. If you are female, you are a female. And even scientists, doctors have proven that in a homosexual and a heterosexual, the hormones are the same. And then the hormones don't make a difference in your preference anyway. It's not the hormones, because if you inject a male with estrogen, the female hormone, all it does, that does not change its preference, it just changes sex It changes its sex drive, not its preference. So the preference is something that you learn, it's what you expose to. But then, you know, you don't have the grace, like that man said, the grace of God, because they say that there's a post of throwing of grace boldly, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Because if it wasn't for God's grace, the things that I'm going to speak for myself, things that I've been exposed to, I'd be crazy right now. <laughs> I'm telling you. The thing that, uh, I grew up in California, and, and everybody know about California, but it was God's grace that kept me in my right mind. Because I was exposed to some of everything in California. Believe me, but uh, because of God's grace and His Word, and He renewing my mind, I'm where I'm at. Amen. I'd like to uh, answer the question first by saying um, I don't feel like I'm qualified to determine whether somebody uh, is born with uh, those particular afflictions or not. Um, I'm not totally dependent on science, but in the situations where science upholds scripture, uh, archaeology upholds scripture, uh, I stand firm. Uh, but that isn't one that has been upheld uh, either way. Uh, scriptures do not speak directly on that issue. Uh, so I don't feel qualified to speak on it uh, either. Um, having said that, I also um, do understand that certain behaviors um, do have uh, some type of perspective that may lead you to believe that the person was born with it. Tourette's is one of them. I would imagine uh, cursing and saying foul things to people. Uh, 
would be considered ill behavior or unscriptural or uh, against God's law in a sense. Um, but here is a condition that afflicts you uh, and you are born with it. Uh, and then there are other uh, aff afflictions that people have that they're born with because we live in a world that has been uh, degrading ever since Adam of sin. Uh, and I do want to uphold Sister Minister's uh, scripture and I'll re-quote what she uh, read. Uh, chapter, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Um, and that was Genesis chapter 2. However, if you read from that point through chapter 3, uh, you'll find a myriad of things happen, uh, which was inclusive of the fall of man. Uh, and that one of God's warnings uh, and his command to Adam to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was that he would die. Uh, it said the day that you eat, if you read the St. Joseph's version, it even says the moment, the moment that you eat. So uh, we know that Adam died spiritually. We also know that Adam began a uh, clock physically uh, for death. Uh, not only for him, but for the, the world as well. And I believe that that degradation um, is what leads us to a point of not being able to uphold, um, at least in practicality, the verse I previously read. Um, we, we are not in God's image once he removed his spirit from us. We're no longer uh, in his image anymore. And just for scripture back up to this, I'll turn to Genesis chapter 5. Um, beginning in verse 1, it says, uh, this is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his likeness and his own image. And he named him Seth. Okay, and so if you begin to read, this is leading to the story of Noah, when God got so fed up with man's sin, disobedience, that he flooded the entire earth and created, recreated, uh, restarted our, our, uh, our, our descendancy. Uh, and so based on that, we see that when God removed his spirit from Adam, you cannot pass along something in your um, in your descendancy. You can't pass something along that you don't have. So not having God's spirit, every person born since that time period has been born without God's spirit. And so the goal of God is to get his spirit back into man. And so to me, you're born capable or inherently um, possible to be able to demonstrate any kind of sin or affliction, uh, physical or uh, behavior-wise. And I'm only upholding what uh, Brother Minister said before uh, Sister uh, Minister spoke, uh, just to be able to clarify the fact that, again, I don't know one way or the other whether you can be born specifically uh, bisexual or homosexual. I'm not qualified to speak on that. Um, and since scripture doesn't speak directly on that, I, I, I won't either. However, I will say that um, kind of based on the first topic of the law and how you understand that can determine uh, the very issues that we're talking about in regards to uh, what your identity could be as either a human or a Christian or just a, a human without God's spirit or a human with God's spirit. And so that determination is something that needs to be nailed down before you can figure out the question itself. Uh, whether that, that can even lead you to the answer, I'm not sure, but I would think you at least want to determine um, what our full capacity is, both negative and positive, uh, without God's spirit and with God's spirit. It's a, uh just entertain your mind for a bit. This is not a uh, scripture record that I have ever found. 
but uh, in the beginning, God created man. If you want to loosely say that homosexuality is them, you could say that, but it wouldn't be biblical because the reason I say that he created woman from Adam's rib. So after that, there was nothing in Adam that would have female tendencies if you just want to entertain your mind for for our imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and I would also uh, speak to that and say uh, clearly, the, when it says this in Genesis chapter five, uh, and he called them man, um, it skips up to 130 years in Adam's life and says he had Seth and then Seth was in his likeness and in his image of Adam. And so based on that, that's how we look at any descendancy from Adam on uh, to have that capability within them. And we see it played out when you read through chapter 5 up to Noah and how they were acting and demonstrating at that time that your initial aspect of unbelief, which is the original sin, uh, in my opinion, and I, I can back that up with scripture if it's needed, but um, that the original sin being unbelief, that is what leads and opens the door to all of the other things, the passions of sin, and simple passions, and also for <coughs> behavioral sins that we see that people demonstrate on, and that that happens at periods of time in which you first did not believe. And so your unbelief and disobedience of not trusting and depending on God 100% is what leads you down pathways and roads of behavior that uh, are, are fulfillments of you not trusting in what God said, trusting in his word and following, again, his law. And so we have to know what God's law is, follow that law, and then um, that's how you steer clear of those um, exigent behaviors that come based on your initial disbelief or distrust in God. I, I just want to apologize again for me. This is what Jesus said. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adultery, Fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. He gives a litany of behaviors, a litany of behaviors that stem from the heart of man. The heart of man. Because of sin, the heart contains every propensity to do everything. And until that heart is changed, this does not come about because the person may be born a certain way. It's the heart issue that's the problem. And that heart is the springboard for every kind of activity. Once Jesus deals with the heart issue, because the Bible says the church was made up of homosexuals and everybody else. And he said, and such were some of you. But now you're washed. It's the heart that <coughs> We're going to take a five minute break The station identification For Poor Soul Society And we're going to come back and finish up This particular topic because we have A couple other people ministers that need to speak you know, On that particular aspect So we're going to go ahead and take a five minute break And we'll be back
have have anyone um, in his name to be set. Set is also the line that Christ came to I want uh, to make a distinction for that. And also, um, Adam had another son, Cain, who uh, totally went the other way. So my point in making those two distinctions is that naturally, yeah, you're born to sin, but it didn't corrupt the fact that God created us men and female. It corrupted the fact of us confirming being in, being in agreement with God's uh, law, who God is, his character. It marked that ability. We no longer had the ability to follow him with our own power. So that's one of the main All right, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, before we move on, I'm gonna give a couple of scriptures that I, I find relevant uh, to our topic, and uh, you can read them at your own time, but 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and 10. Then you can read them at your own time, and we'll just, we just take a look. First Timothy 1 and 10, James 4 and 12. Leviticus 20 and 13. Leviticus 18 and 22. Matthew 19 and 5. Jude 1 and 7. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. And my last one is 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. And at your own time, you can read that. And there's going to be a part two of this, but just just for references. And also, a favorite one of mine would be Genesis 19, where it talks about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another scripture, uh, and it's in Romans 9, verse 20. And it says this, But who are you? O man, to answer back to God. For what is molded, say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Do we have the right to say to our God, no matter what state we're in, because he has a purpose for it. It's up to us to know that purpose and to follow it out and to do the will of God in the state that we're in. All right, we're going to move on to question number three, homosexuality and bisexuality and learned behavior. So we can pretty much say from our previous conversation that it's a learned behavior. <laughs> so, <yeah>. Why <laughs> tell me? <laughs> now, y'all All this stuff you wrote on here, we got to wipe that. And then somebody has an opposing argument. Well, not, not necessarily opposing, I just have uh, insight. Uh, scriptural insights to, to uh, bring to the table. Uh, this ties into what Brother Minister was saying when he brought up uh, Cain and Abel. Um, and it's in 1 John uh, chapter 3. Actually, I'll start chapter 2, verses 28. Um, it says, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, he may we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. 
but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away your sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. And no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been sinning. I'm sorry, he cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. If anyone has a material possession and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words of tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And so I said that to tie into what we originally started on about clarifying what the law is, and just clarify what God's commands are, and it's to believe in him and to love one another, to not be like Cain was towards Abel and be a murderer. And that's all hatred is towards somebody else is, is, is you becoming a murderer. And there's no room for that in heaven. And so the reality of what we're demonstrating on and what this topic is, is that there needs to be an equalization of all sin, recognizing that the original sin is unbelief, and that if you don't believe and then don't demonstrate that by loving one another, that it doesn't matter what your behavior winds up being. It's more important that you follow God's commands and that his command says to believe on him, on Jesus Christ, and to love one another than it is for us to single out people based on certain behavioral practices that they may have. We need to get them the gospel so that they can believe on Jesus Christ and then show them love so that they understand what God's love was towards us. And, and only in recognition of our own propensity towards being a murderer, not a liar, not a fornicator, not anything else but a murderer because of our hatred towards others, do we then begin to demonstrate and act on what the gospel is really about? And so I say that towards the topics, the last two questions, is that um, 
whether or not you want to say that you're born with homosexuality or that you aren't born with it, it doesn't matter in view of the gospel's effect on you as you relate to it. This is like this. 
if a dog come up to me and speak the word of God, and I know the word of God, I'm going to listen to that dog. Why? If that dog is speaking the truth, and I know that he's speaking from this, I will listen. But now, to follow, now that's a different time. He said, up as follow, I'll listen to the word of God as long as it's true. I may not agree with everything that I'm hearing coming off the book, but if it's lining up with this, to me, it doesn't matter who it all was coming from. But God said this. When he was coming to Jerusalem, they were all hail to the Lord. So I oh, hallelujah to him. Praise God. He said, they was telling him, tell him to shut up, tell him to shut up. But God said this. If they would shut up, he said, who would cry out? He said, the lot should cry out. But now, I don't think that one should pastor or be head. But if, if someone is speaking the truth, I'm, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to the truth. I, I guess if my ear is tuned to the truth, if it's the truth, it's the truth. The word of God is the word of God, whether it's come from a dog, a cat, someone is uh, homosexual, it's the truth. It's the truth. I think we need to give more um, credit to that type of a perspective in the sense that uh, I think we've gone too far in giving somebody who has been given whatever gift they've been given uh, as a pastor or whatever, uh, a point in which we begin to follow them too closely. Right, right. To the degree right. that it needs to be an equalization uh, on both ends of bringing us closer to a moderate perspective of what you were saying, that we need to be more honorable towards truth than we are towards a man. Now the God, the, the, the gift may not be revoked, but that does not mean that you are 100% of the time demonstrating on that gift. I'm sure in your personal life at home uh, that your family may communicate times in which you weren't demonstrating in that gift per se, which means that there are times in which you could be teaching, leading, and be subject to the humanity that God uh, uh, has revealed is in, in all of us. And that if we're following the truth, even if you go run off a cliff, we have sense enough to stop at the edge and not come right behind you, per se. And so carrying your gift to the grave at the bottom of that ravine you know, could be whatever God's destiny was for you does not necessarily mean that everybody else has to demonstrate on that level in which it allows for a person, if you're, uh, I guess, homosexual or bisexual uh, and or pastoring, I guess, that you should be held to the same standard. And so when you get to that subject level in which you probably aren't demonstrating on truth, that we should know not to follow you in that aspect as well. Any more than we should follow somebody else who is a, a pastor or a teacher and may have a propensity to lie. Or somebody else as a pastor or a minister that has a propensity to curse. Or somebody else as a pastor or minister that has uh, been caught, that we know of, fornicate. Uh, or somebody else as a pastor or minister that has been caught in the number of the list of myriad of things that Brother Minister over here enumerated a while ago. And so that uh, that gift does not remove you from humanity, but it merely uh, emphasizes your ability to highlight truth, hopefully, and that if we're following anything, that's what we're following is truth and not people. I want to speak on that. You know, the Bible tells us it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. So my question is, is there really an anointing there on this person that's practicing? He's a shepherd, but he or she may be a shepherd, but they're practicing homosexuality or bisexuality. Is the anointing there? You know, I think that's a very fair and good question. Is it really there? If you if you if you still love the yoke of bondage, is the anointing really there? Because we found that there are pastors that we later learned uh, were beating their wives on a regular basis 
that we later learned were demonstrating again on any number of those levels uh, that I don't know why homosexuality would be the more shocking one as much as it is to say we're talking a whole community of people and we've never validated or verified this issue of anointing uh, or if that is something that we should hold valid towards somebody that we choose to look at as a pastor or a This, wait a minute, I just want to finish up. This is one of the reasons why I am very leery about following anybody. Because when Christ gave up the ghost on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent. Bringing in a new dispensation, okay? Each and every human being on this planet is fallible. God is infallible. And he desires to have a relationship, a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And my utmost desire is to be led of him. Not of human of another human being, but to be led of Christ. And we're here to enumerate that, so I agree and I'll uphold what, what Brother Minister is saying too. What we're trying to do is to see the anointing. Uh, but the only way you can see the anointing is that it breaks the yoke. Uh, we follow pastors because we hear the word of God that we know. Now, if you want to say, uh, can you follow a homosexual pastor or somebody practicing or whatever? Uh, I've been to a few seminary classes. And one thing I learned, and I'm not, you can look it up, you can study, you can go into uh, the seminary and find it out. But the Bible that we have, the King James Version, if you study King James, King James was a practicing homosexual. And if we cannot listen to the word of God through a man that we don't know nothing about, because we don't really know anybody, God only knows. So if you're not hearing the truth of the word through the person that you're following, the Holy Spirit will let you know and you'll go somewhere else. But it is not our job to cut people down. It is our job to really get what God has for us and then once we get that, either God will move us or God will leave us there to be able to demonstrate another way. And then maybe that particular pastor or that particular minister will begin to see themselves because we can't change it. God is the only one that can do that. Well, I want to uh, bring the question back out to be would you be willing to listen to and to be shepherded by a practicing homosexual or bisexual preacher? My answer to that question is absolutely no. I may stand alone on this view, but just going by the scripture in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm not going to read all this, but it was a, a, an immoral sexual act going on in the church. And Paul wrote to the church about a congregational ministry member and told them to purge the evil person from among you. Get rid of it because of the viewpoint that it, it lays out. If it's okay and there's no church discipline, which is one of the problems today in our churches, there's no church discipline, then it's going to persist. It's going to grow. It's a learned behavior. If it's okay and I respect that person, then I can do that and still claim Christ as well. I can live that way. Also, there are criteria of being a, pra a pastor, a minister, a bishop. And the, the criteria don't fit the question. So therefore, biblically, I would have to say, no, I am not going to listen and be up under a practicing homosexual, bisexual preacher. Also, yeah, Lord can speak to anyone. Just like he did through the Pharisees when he said that for one man to die, you know, it's good for the nation. But, who was following? Did Christ tell us to follow the Pharisees or to follow him? He said follow him. So, my understanding and my perspective, biblically, I'm going to have to say never way possible that I am going to do that. And what needs to happen is you need to purge the evil from your church, even if it's the past. Yeah.
now I'm going to have to say no to that because then that will be someone who's naive or don't know. They will be like, oh, this is okay to be like this. Um, so I can listen to them talk about God. I, it's okay for me to still sleep with a, a man of man or a woman of woman. So now I'm, I got to sell men raping little kids. And I, I only, I only want to say brief, briefly, real briefly that those things happen uh, despite somebody being practicing or not. And I'm not saying that I would follow either. I'm merely saying that I'm a follower of uh, truth and God's word in that sense that I think it would precipitate whether or not I would be under somebody's who's practicing uh, whatever that statement actually means. Is it professed practicing or what? Because everybody's, in my opinion, practicing some, some sin, behavioral sin, uh, and it's a matter of whether it's on record or not. Um, and so that issue is something where I think we need to be clear because you may wind up finding that there are certain parameters in which you don't necessarily fit, like what the minister said, uh, in which you uh, are not put into that position because of, uh, you know, antecedent conditions that came before you were able to accept that type of a position, you know, are you called or self-called, you know. So it's, it's just a matter of making those distinctions from the beginning uh, to that you get to this question may not even, it's a moot point, you know, because you can be practicing on, on either side, whether it's known or unknown, uh, and you would have been just mistaken right, to find was, out that it's was was following the shepherd that was doing it. Right, just make a quick second about what he said. From my perspective, I'm saying this is a fact that, that you know from the question, that you, this is something that he's practicing in his out in the world, not something that you don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, in terms of a question, a practicing, following a practicing homosexual is a misnomer for this reason. I think we fail to kind of, this is my perspective, there's a failure to understand to a large degree what the Lord has said about following him. Paul said, you follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, I personally believe there, that with all of our faults, there, there are people who are really trying to lead and do what the Lord has called them to do in the pool. If a man is a practicing homosexual, I don't know why we think the Lord is involved in that anyway. I don't understand where that concept would come from when the scripture said, real clear, come out from among them. So it seems to me that if God has already pronounced a decision on a certain behavior, that if I choose to follow the behavior that God has already condemned, why would I think that he's allowing, working with me, helping me, being there for me any when I'm completely out of order. If I'm out of order, I don't know why I would expect God is, I can go through the motions, stand up and preach and, and go through the motions, that doesn't mean the Lord is with me. So I think in answer to the question, would you be willing, the responsibility seems to be on the person. You know, you know who you're going to follow and who you're not going to follow. So, no, I don't, I'm not even a brother here. Would you be willing to listen and to be shepherd? Yeah. Not if you know the truth. And the truth is what the scriptures say. The truth is not an arbitrary thing that we make up in our minds that uh, I'm going to follow the truth and we make these kind of statements when the scripture tells us about 
truth and error. They're sometimes so fine. That's how the enemy trips up people. A little truth here, a little error here mixed together, and you really don't know what we're following. So if it's clear, the Lord tells us about our behavior. And if a man does not measure up to what God is saying in terms of his behavior, if he is practicing homosexual, what the question said, if he's openly practicing, what in your right mind would you want to follow that individual for? If he is openly practicing and you know that God can do it. That's an obvious I have the way, the truth, and the life. So when I speak that I follow the truth, I'm talking about a capital T uh, truth in reference to Jesus Christ himself. Um, and just to clarify that point that I uh, want to be able to keep us focused on clarifying the issues up front before we deal. The question is problematic in a sense because that subject of law that we started off with is required for us to answer all the subsequent questions. And so we're already demonstrating on a level in which we uh, are being speculative at best without defining the law as it applies to us today to determine how to even answer these questions, that they will probably disappear uh, because we would have so much clarity on the front end that we would need to ask certain questions per se or they would just seem new. I just wanted to say something that was uh, said earlier about the call. Uh, one of the ministers, the sister minister, said that God doesn't make any mistakes. Um, he's righteous all the time. He's perfect. So when you look at the call, being called upon someone that's practicing, I don't think God would make that mistake. But like we said also earlier, such were us. You know, we, we did come out of that, but there was a great change, the change of conversion. And we're no longer practicing that. You know, so that's a different perspective. You know, they're saying one is openly, appreciate the word of us, openly practicing. So that, that makes a big difference. You know, we're, we all have been converted from something. But all of us. Some of us even more than one something. Right. Right. Sure. And if, if, if I can speak for myself, I'm an ex porn paper, ex liar, ex shooter. You know, as long as it's ex in front of us and I got Christ in me, I'm okay. Uh, we're gonna uh, begin to uh, exit out of this time. What we're gonna do is, uh, I, I, I knew that this was gonna get in depth. <laughs> and. Uh, one question I, I wanted to uh, pose to the people was, should homosexuals and bisexuals worship amongst themselves? No. No. They can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think the no's have to be qualified. <laughs> well, I would say no because I'm, I'm sorry, but let's go. The Bible tells us that uh, that the wheat and the child grow up together. Uh, so we cannot separate that from worshiping together. Now, whether we call it worship and they don't call it worship, or we got to get the definition of worship. But uh, I think we cannot stop that issue. I agree with Brother Minister because how else will they know to come out of what they are, they are enslaved in if we're not discipling? Uh, but that comes with some respect and ability as well. You know, you have to have church discipline. You know, you have to be able to deal with those issues in the correct way. And you know, one of the problems is, is, as a church, we just don't understand the process, you know, of how to, to work with that. But the answer for me is you have to worship together. And if they're coming to worship, they should know um, you know, not that it's a criteria, but that, like you said earlier, Brother Minister, it's about the love. And how can we love them if we put them out? Now, the scripture that we gave 
earlier, I gave earlier about uh, purging evil from you. That scripture is saying, give him up to the devil. Don't, if you call himself a brother, you don't sit down and eat with him. You don't, you let him know he's still in the church, but that this is the same. We don't live like this. You know, you give him up to the devil so in hope that he can see the error of his ways and come back to Christ. I don't think we lack in discipline um, and most people's understanding of discipline that uh, homosexuals and bisexuals, um, the, the gay community at large was being persecuted and uh, resorting to worshiping amongst themselves because of their not being accepted or feeling accepted and that it's gotten so bad that even though in your mindset and maybe anybody on this panel's mindset, there are no ideas of violence on how to purge <coughs> this evil out, but that that is even exercised towards them as well. And I think that's why it's important for us to equalize sinful behavior amongst ourselves and not isolate one to another because there are people who um, don't have the fortitude of insight and the ability of reason to determine and how to interact with someone who is openly practicing whatever their, you can put whatever sinful behavior you want to put behind that. So how do we, why is it that they seem to be demonstrated on more and violently acted against more? And I'm not talking outside of the church, I'm talking inside of the church. I, again, this question, should homosexuals and bisexuals, we're talking about it, certain group of people. And we keep quoting scripture. The Bible says and teaches us that worship is defined by God as something that Jesus said. God sees those that we worship him in spirit and in truth. So those who are practicing and abhorrent behavior, I just feel to see how that can be done in spirit and in truth that the scripture describes. So in terms of worshiping, I don't see how that's even worshiping. It's not done in truth because they're not living in truth. So that's just not. Can I add real quick just a scripture to back up what uh, Brother Minister just just said, uh, or add to, uh, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this spiritual act of worship. And so it's that you sacrifice yourself and offer yourself uh, in service to each other. And again, that's why I'm saying we have to be careful how we phrase this in order that we don't encourage get to the point of violence uh, and be welcoming of our brothers and sisters or even potential brothers and sisters uh, despite their, if you want to call it delusion, into which acts they're caught up in. <coughs> and so I think that we need to be more open towards that because it's been too much of a history of violence against them. And so we need to rephrase how we demonstrate towards the homosexual gay community? Well, um, I kind of agree with that in a sense. Um, I don't really agree with how with the homosexual gender is making themselves uh, look like a society, so to speak. Uh, seeing is seeing, period. I appreciate what you said about, you know, overlooking all the other different scenes that goes on in the church. But this particular panel is on homosexuality. If we were talking about other issues, I would stand the same for the fornication in the church, for this any type of thing. But love, discipline, and discipline is loving. Uh, you look at that perspective from your own household. I don't curse my kids when they do wrong. You know, I discipline them. I love them because I don't want them to fall into whatever I'm disciplining them for. So as as the homosexuals come through the church. The church has the responsibility to let them know that this particular act is wrong. I think you call yourself a brother, then it's definitely wrong, but you have to discipline 
in love. You know, this I think they're clear in. on that the church believes it to be wrong. I don't think we mince words about that as the church towards homosexuality. I think the problem again comes at the point in which we may have even caused the boldness of the community by the demonstrations of the clarity of that message uh, that they now settle in to being separate and distinct and being a community and trying to foster pride in themselves because of direct rebellion against the things that the church have imposed by separating. And I'm not saying anybody on this panel is guilty of doing that per se. I'm saying that that's why we have to be careful how we phrase things and how we apply our, our knowledge of scripture towards them because I think what's happened to date, the church has pushed the homosexual community to the place where it is by its refusal uh, to accept and then also by its acts of violence against uh, homosexual community. I would say this, I'll let anybody else speak, you know, Max. Uh, and I'll, I'll, say that too, I'll say that I haven't seen that um, in the churches that I have been affiliated with. Growing up in a family church, I, I haven't seen that. What I see most of the time is the church expressing how loving God is and pushing the message that it is okay, in my experience. That, you know, oh, it's fine you can live that way, you know. It's the love of God. As long as you have God in your heart and you are such and such and you can make the, the, the confession, the great confession, you, you can pretty much do what you want because God loves you. I see more of that perspective than the one that you're speaking of. I know, but we should limit our uh, understanding to, I'm saying to our experiences per se, the statistics that we can show through. And, and that, that, that type of attitude is really uh, a form of witchcraft and rebellion. See, because the Bible clearly states that it's wrong to engage in such a lifestyle, such as homosexuality, but actually sin is sin. Uh, the, the key word in this instance is salvation. You know, uh, and this is why it's so important for each and every one of us to establish a relationship with Christ on a personal level. Uh, to receive that anointing and that power. See, because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're wrestling with spiritual witness. And uh, these entities are real. And if you don't have no power or no anointing, you ain't got nothing coming. In other words, you fair game. How can you have someone that is stuck in the mud and the mire and you ain't got no power to do it? But it is that, like Christ said, it is not I that do the work, but it is the Father in me. So if you ain't got, if Christ is not in you, how can you do the work? And if you're not led of Christ, how can you have the wisdom and the understanding to lead someone to salvation? You know, you working on it, like Paul said, they have, they have a zeal, but no knowledge. You know, so. Actually, from what I see, most of us are just talking with no demonstration. Demonstration of what? Faith. See, because it's the faith that calls those things in the invisible realm to manifest in the visible realm. And the key element, along with the heart, which is basically the spirit, is our minds. Everything is manifested, created in the mind. Look around you. Everything you see around you was conceived in someone's mind before it even manifested on its physical plane. So our hearts and our minds has to be cleansed and purged. And our, and our hearts have to be merged with the Holy Spirit in order for that conversion to take place. So the key word is salvation. We must first work out our own salvation before we try to save the world. Because you got enemies working against you. And they play have the keys. Uh, my brother Minister said about we don't want to do the violent part of it. I 
get that, but it's just like going back to the mother and your father. If you disrespect them and you know you cause hell in the homes, they gotta push you out. And this is what God, like you said, a whole community of them. If that's where they want to be, that's fine. But some do come back and change. But that's up to them. So those, that society, if that's where they want to be, what happened to the children of Israel? We got we, one, we, one minute. Mm-hmm. And so we definitely don't have to pick this up again. And I was just going to say we're going to have to conclude right there because this 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 will definitely run over. So we would have to do a part two of this. Um, and, and we'll set the time up and, and get everything out to everybody. I appreciate everybody that came out of it, all that endeavors to do because this is something that we really need to work on. And I'm not just saying as homosexuality, I'm saying it as sin. Clearly. Because our churches, to me, have no spine anymore. And, yeah, for you two, y'all can come get me. I don't like that. So. And then the end, I want to thank everybody for coming out once again. And uh, hope to see you at the next panel. God bless you, God keep you.